Welcome and thank you for joining us today. You're listening to Society Bites Radio, and I'm your host, Dr. Richard Himmer. And I'm Sherry Himmer, and this is Authentically You, social interaction for the mind and soul. For the next 25 minutes, we like to talk about healing and growth from the inside out. And then remember, you are 100% responsible for your own happiness, joy, and well-being. Sherry, in our last segment, we went into detail about a connect and redirect, a cognitive distortion, a cognitive distortion at the teenage mother level and talked a little bit about the fact that this is a principle. It works at both um, mother, father, mother, daughter relationships, spousal relationships, but also at the corporate level. I do want to cover a little bit at the corporate level today, Yeah. but would you be good enough just to summarize kind of the gist of where we're going and, and one of the myths that we were really kind of addressing? So what happens, I think, is where we get into an emotionally resistant situation relationships is that we always have this minutia. We think of the things that our people, our family members or whoever need to be what they need to be accomplishing. We walk in a room. What we see is a teenager uh, doing social media. They're obviously not doing what they need to be. And we fire we execute, you need to do this, you need to do X, Y, and Z. Without that principle of when we walk into a room, we need to connect with that person. Trying to cattle prod people along is not the way to build a relationship. And that's why we get resistance. And that's why we get an emotionally irrational person who's going to say things like, you're the worst mom in the world. So we really define what and showed how this mom was able to change a situation because that um, case study was actually reality for someone. They yeah. actually were able to turn it around. It wasn't us just saying, this is what it would look like in the perfect world. It was her experience of changing her direction to, I'm going to connect with my daughter first. The I'm going to find out what she's really doing. And then I can bring in what it is that are the productive things she needs to get to, but let her have a voice about how it's going to get done. Her daughter actually solved the whole thing. And she told me it was amazing. I didn't have to solve it at all. All she wanted was five minutes to come home, grab a bite to eat and relax. She says, I have no problem picking up the poop, mom. I just don't want to do it when I walk in the door. Can I just get a little bit of time? Yeah. Yeah. That was it. So it was a great example of connect and redirect, but it's such a principle that if we were to have, instead of the list of to do in our head, have the principles I need to have at the forefront of my mind, use that part of our brain instead of really that list to do is an emotional re knee jerk reaction to I feel overwhelmed. That's when we've lost um, our reasoning power and given it over to emotional reasoning where it controls us. Right. So let's move off into explaining what happens with the emotions versus the logic. And what I do a lot is explain using the terms of the movie, How to Train Your Dragon. So if you haven't seen the movie, then you'll do best to follow along. But it's it's a, quite a popular show and there's three of them. And lately, I don't know if I have I been telling you, but I've got two clips um, now I'm showing that the clients in the office and having them then explain what's happening in this in the scene. So, so this is a Dr. Himmer model for emotional reasoning. Yeah. So what we got um, the protagonist in the show is Hiccup. He's the chief's son and um, little Viking, little kid. Viking kid and scrawny yeah. and skinny. And everyone so else is actually into his young adult years. Yeah. But. Every everyone else is just massive Vikings. Right. His dad is just this huge chieftain of the village. Um, but he ends up capturing a dragon and training the dragon. But what's interesting is the dragon has a broken tail. So um, and like he a broken rudder. Yeah. He actually gives him a prosthetic tail mm -hmm. or a prosthetic rudder. And the rudder is the terminology I use. The power of the entire story is in the dragon. But the, the brainchild and the way it's done is in the boy, the trainer. His name is Hiccup. The dragon's name is Toothless. Yep. So you've got this scenario where they end up working together to fight bad guys, bad dragons, <laughs> and, and other people who are involved in it. And the entire issue is how those two learn to work together and integrate their respective skill sets. So the idea is if Hiccup is without Toothless, 
Hiccup is a scrawny, skinny guy. He doesn't have the power to do much. He's a smart feller, but he's not going to get where he needs to go. Toothless can't fly without Hiccup on the back of him because Toothless or Hiccup has rigged the contraption so his tail can extend out. The prosthetic would then allow him to fly. And it's connected to the saddle that Hiccup's on. That is exactly right. So the two become one. Yes. And, it's, and that's all we're trying to illustrate here. When Hiccup's in charge and Toothless wants to have the same thing Hiccup does, so they share values, they share willpower. But they have the same target in their vision. They can't be, they're inconquerable. So this is a flying dragon, by the way. Yes. These dragons fly. I guess all flagons dry. We're talking about mythical all creatures. All flagons dry? <laughs> Do they really? I flagons never knew dry. that. All <laughs> dragons fly. All flagons dry. Hmm. And, but if, if um, when Toothless is left without Hiccup, and it happens in the, the every single one of the movies, Toothless ends up without Hiccup, and he's struggling through the air because he can't control it until at some point in time he's able to. But he's flailing through the air. Hiccup's flailing through the air, and they finally reconnect. Flailing through the air is our version of being flooded. Mm -hmm. You're emotionally reasoning. Emotion's there. Reason's there, but they're not connected. They're not working together on the same page. When we go to fight or flight or freeze or faint, we are separated. We are not working with our subconscious or downstairs brain along with our upstairs brain. So if we could use Daniel Siegel's popular model of a brain using the hand, mm -hmm. when the hand, the fingers in the air, which is our prefrontal cortex, it's separated from the emotional center of our brain. And that's when we're flipped that's or right. triggered and yeah. into flood. Okay, so there's our setting. That's, that's the setting and it's a principle on everything that we're doing. And the idea behind it is that years and years ago, the argument was, at least in my reading, stems about 1200, they can track it to the 1200s. I think they can track it earlier, but where they argue that emotions are weak and people who have emotions are less than. People who use reason and, and logic are greater than. And then they stereotyped it into male and female. Now my research has shown that men and I'm stereotyping again, men who tend to think that they're very reasonable and rational, and I'm going to, again, stereotype to the, to the uh, engineer. engineer approach, oftentimes are without an awareness that they're not connecting. And everything's about the connection. So they end up having attachment challenges with their children, especially their daughters. And they're the only ones who don't realize that they're being driven by the very thing that they say is weak, and that's their emotions. One might ask, then, how can they be driven by emotions if they're just reasonable and rational and they're not connecting? They're not connecting because they fear. Mm, they're which afraid. is an emotion. It's an emotion. And that fear and love or fear and connecting don't share space. Mm. So they are That's driven really by the very thing they claim is less than, that they're not. And I think that's not only is it a projection, but it's a discounting. And we can go down a number of cognitive distortions, and I think you would find there's reason to believe that people who are just in their heads are cognitively distorted. There's a dissonance going on. So I want to cover just a, a few of those. So um, real quick, I got this blog this morning as we got here today from Seth Godin, who's one of my favorite bloggers. And the title of the blog is, I'm Sorry Takes Guts. Here's his story. I recently saw two men arguing about who got to use the urinal next. And I'm thinking that okay, happened. that image, like, I that don't really want to go there. But. Was he at the airport? You know, yeah. where, where was he? The office building? As a result. The standoff. <laughs> As they stand up. I'm sorry. That's a little too I, graphic. I, I thought that was pretty funny. As a result, <laughs> neither got what he wanted and neither could honestly say that his day got better. True. Because, so let's just think for a second. Right. What's the prime directive? What do both of them want to do? They need to go pee. They go, need to go to the bathroom. But what did they both do? Not go pee. That's called collusion. That's emotional reasoning. <laughs> the need to win every interaction, the inability to apologize, the short term over the long term. This is not a sign of strength. It is a symptom of immaturity and weakness that almost always leads to to suboptimal results. If apologizing engages the network and makes it more likely that we can stay in sync, it pays for itself many times over. And then my notes came in. So the question I wrote down here was, what are they telling themselves that's not true? 
So I started brainstorming, right? right? So I got a couple ideas. So if he pees first, I lose. <laughs> Only if you wet your pants. But I'm thinking, wow, <laughs> amazing. That has to be one of the things that they're telling it's, themselves. It just seems so asinine. Huh? <clears throat> like, then it was sorry, labeling. Sorry. He only cares about himself. Well, what are you doing? If he only cares about himself and he wants to pee. You're going to argue with him because you only care about yourself. Because you only care about yourself because you want to pee. So are you projecting? Does he care more about himself than you care about yourself? Yeah, this Again, is the pity of immaturity. Reason. It's projecting. Yeah. So you're projecting onto him what you yourself are doing. So, for example, when you're driving in five o'clock traffic and it's terrible and you get mad at everybody driving in traffic because they're all in traffic. Does anyone ever take a minute to go? What are they thinking about me? I'm in traffic. Are you somehow different because you're driving in traffic? That's why I don't like going to Seattle. We actually are not going to a concert because of Seattle traffic. I don't want to fight it. We've we've gone to concerts now. We've not gone to because of Seattle traffic. <laughs> so I don't want to fight. 90 minutes to go to a 90 a minute, minute a, minimum. a minimum, a 90-minute drive one way to go to a 90-minute presentation to drive home 90 minutes. Well, on the way home, it's usually double. Yeah. Okay. And then lastly, blaming. He's the reason I can't pee right now. It's his fault. <laughs> I think that's fascinating. Well, okay. It's a really graphic example. It kind of helps you feel the urgency of... A um, little emphasis there. I know. Of <laughs> resolving our issues when we are really head-to-head -head with someone at the head. <laughs> You're having okay. a little too much fun with this. We're going to change topics. Yeah, you better. So during a recent debrief with the CEO and the president of a Midwest organization, I was doing the Harrison with them. And I'm going over his traits So would you break down what is the Harrison? Yeah, we've covered this a little bit before. The Harrison is assessment. It's a traits and behavior okay. assessment, not a personality assessment. It's heavily on uh, emotional intelligence type things. But it's based on preferences. So it's a, it's a law that we call the enjoyment performance theory. Uh, Meaning not a law, that a theory. you... When you enjoy doing something, you do more of it. When you do more of it, you get usually better and you get compliments. And when you get compliments, you like to do it more. But the same is also true for the other end. If I don't enjoy doing something, so the one I'm going to talk about is um, being frank or having conflict. If I don't enjoy conflict, then I'm going to do a lot less of con conversations with conflict. I'll avoid it, right? Which means I don't get better at it and I don't necessarily get complimented. I might just – some people might just – Say to me, boy, you know, you do anything not to have an argument, won't you? And they'll take advantage of me because they know I'm conflict adverse, which means I don't like to do it even more. That theory comes from the basic understanding of neuroscience that our beliefs that we have about ourselves internally drive our behavior. OK, if I set that up. Yeah. OK, yeah. So we were reviewing his traits and, and the <clears throat> meanings behind the numbers. And for him, for example, he was an authoritative. That's a 9.7. It's on a 210 scale, six being in the middle. But as you get on the extremes, the twos and the nines, the intensity is magnified by 10 being the high, the 10 being the high, two being the low. The intensity is magnified by, by a magnitude of about five. So it's it's very, very strong. So a 9.7 is a very strong preference for being authoritative. Now, what's the definition? The desire for decision-making authority and the willingness to accept decision-making responsibility. So it doesn't mean that he's an authoritarian. It just means he doesn't mind taking the responsibility for being a leader. Okay. That's an effect. And it's good because he's running the company. He owns the company. So using the Harrison assessment model, being an authoritarian is a desirable or a threshold trait for being an effective leader and what I call a business developer. Now, to me, everybody is in business development. I don't care who you are. And another way to say business development is being in sales. You are always in a position to develop relationships. The deeper the relationships, the greater the re return on investment. That's business. The same thing is true in our model with the daughter and the, and the mother. She's in a business development relationship with her daughter. She's developing the daughter so she can assimilate as an adult in society, not as a teenager. So I'd like to switch that up a little bit. So we're taking this business approach and applying it to family relationships, but I'd also like to put 